Hi everyone, welcome to the podcast. P is for plog. My name is Paul and I'm a plogger. What that means is that every time I go running, I pick up trash. For 13 years I've been doing it in my free time, but since October I've gone professional. This podcast is just sharing that journey and seeing seeing if I can make it work. Today's episode is P is for park run. Plogging is involved in park run, don't you worry. Let's get started. Blogging and tagging and posted and binning. Blogging and tagging and posting and binning. Blogging and tagging and posting and binning. Blogging, 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 blogging. So thanks for joining. If you don't know what this podcast is about, I suggest that you just go and replay the first three episodes. They really give you a good background into what it's all about. Let's start, first of all, with some of the crazy things that have happened in the last week and the crazy trash I've found. I've got a good one. I've got a good one this week. (laughs) So on Sunday, I did a group run with a club that's called Sunday Run here in Harlem. It was actually a bit wasn't such nice weather so there was only two of us we did a nice sort of 18 kilometer we sort of said okay let's just go further so we got a sort of like a nice 18 kilometer run done and just before we departed we were just talking about plogging all the way through and and he said you should go and do this this section that's near near the house and because it's just full of people that just dump their stuff there a lot of trucks actually stay there overnight and you can sort of see a lot of waste from there but also people use it as a dumping ground so I went there and it did not disappoint I found some bongos of these small drums uh, just in the in the you know in the bushes and I managed to sort of get it out I didn't realize they were so heavy they were just crazy heavy and the membrane had been broken I mean someone could have fixed it it was just too heavy for me to do anything with it other than just sort of report it to the to the council. So for those that are just wondering what do I do with, with big trash, there's an app that's here in the Netherlands called Bouta Beta. And there you can just sort of say, right, I found this dump trash and you, and it will just then contact the council and they'll come and clear it up. And this is, that's exactly what I did with this one. It was just, it was so heavy. It would have been great if I'd have had something it was a bit closer I would have taken it home and done something with it and next to it there was even more trash I found a bed frame I find a lot of these bed frames yeah people just sort of you know those ones with the slats that you see that just uh, sort of support the actual mattress it's I'm not sure how many I find a year it's probably around sort of five or six it always sort of shocks me to sort of see them just sort of thrown in the bushes there. But I tidied it up, put it next to a bin and report it to, to the to the council. That's all done. So that was the weirdest trash that I found. It was it was a good one. That was a good one. First drum, I think first proper drum set that uh, I found. The other thing was I finally got a chance to use my drone. So I bought, as part of going professional, I've got a bit more equipment in terms of filming what I do just to make the most of that. And one of the ones I got was a drone. So the, the DJI Neo, so it's all just paid with uh, with my own money. The trouble is here in Harlem, there's no fly zones everywhere. And, and especially in sort of the beautiful um, nature park that we've got here in South Kennebolond. It's such, such a beautiful landscape, but uh, because it's a protected estate, a nature park you can't use a drone there so and then you've also got the airport which makes it almost no impossible to use a drone here but we went to see my mother-in-law so I sort of took it with me and I could I can do it there so she lives close to Nijmegen and that was a lot of fun I got some good footage there I think I need to sort of change the distance just to make it a little bit more sort of further further back from me because it was a bit too close in but it's just so easy to use it's such a great tool one of the things that I have with plogging is is how can I sort of film myself to really make it a little bit more di- dynamic if you're just sort of just holding a selfie stick out and just showing yourself there's only so much you can do. So I think this is going to be a brilliant tool, but I need to sort of investigate how I can use it here in Harlem. So I've got a license as well, a drone license, which should help. 
So that was pretty good. I was really pleased with the results. It wasn't the best weather conditions, so the uh, the quality of the of the film wasn't as perfect as I as I was hoping for. But that was to be expected when it's sort of getting close to going dark, etc. The sensor on it is quite small. But stay tuned. There'll be uh, if you follow me on Instagram on Way of Life, then you'll see a lot more drone footage when I can. So those were the sort of the fun parts about this week. I'll talk about the actual mileage I've done at the end, but I want to move on to Park Run. That's what this episode's all about. So I think it's worthwhile just talking about the sort of the coincidence of, of where it started back in 2004 and, and sort of my relationship to, to where it started, because it has a lot of history for me. I've never done a Park Run in England. I've only ever done a park run in the Netherlands since it first, uh, the Netherlands sort of started just after COVID. But if you go back to 2004, where, where it started in Bushy Park, I knew Bushy Park quite well in, in the 90s. So in the mid 90s, I was living in Teddington, which is really close by. And in fact, the first triathlon I ever did was, was in Hampton Pool. So it was a little sprint triathlon there. I got the bug for, for triathlons. So I have a lot of history with Bushy Park. And the story that I love to tell people about Bushy Park when I was living there is was the fact that it was a training ground for a lot of Kenyan um, national teams for the, the sort of the marathon runners in those in the sort of the mid nineties. I don't know if it is now, but there'd be a lot of time you'd be running around Teddington and and the Bushy Park area, and you'd see a lot of people in tracksuits with uh, Kenya on the back. And there was this one time, so for those that know Bushy Park, there's this, or don't know it, there's this really long straight that goes down to, I think it's called the, the Diana Fountain now, but it never used to be that when I first went there, obviously. And I used to sort of run down there and then run around the outside of, of Bushy Park. And there's this one time that I was just running down this long straight and there's this sort of very gra or I don't know if it still is, but there was this sort of large grass area that you could run on. It was really good, sort of next to the road. So I was running on that, just sort of jogging or sort of trying to do my sort of standard pace, uh, probably around five, five thirty a kilometre there. And this Kenyan runner just raced past me. And it was it was almost like one of those cartoons you see where they go so fast, it's all the air turbulence sort of just spins you around on a little pirouette I was just like Jesus going so fast I could never run that fast I can't sprint that fast and he was just like straight down there and I was like I was so depressed I was like thinking I can never run that fast I can never run that fast and then I saw him get to the to the end where the fountain is the roundabout and then he stopped and then started and he turned around to come back or he was, he was sort of waiting for a little bit and I thought oh no, oh, that makes sense. He's doing intervals. So obviously that was his sort of sprint down at top speed and he's now going to sort of jog back. So I was like, oh, okay, that's okay. I can live with that. I can live with him, that being his sprint speed. But then he turned around and came back at me even faster. Turned out that when he whizzed past me on the way down was actually his recovery part of the interval training that he was doing. He was just jogging it and I just couldn't even sprint that fast. It's incredible the speed that these people do for marathons. I just can't sustain that for any time at all. So Bushy Park, when it first started in 2004, I was, I was in the Netherlands by then, so I didn't have any involvement in it. But, uh, but Bushy Park has a lot of memories for me and, and it's a special place. I kind of like that, the fact that I know where it was born and, and sort of have a connection with it. In terms of my experience with with park run that doesn't start until after the pandemic or sort of around the pandemic time we were I was part of the the people that were looking at setting one up in Harlem I wouldn't say a big part I just sort of came around and sort of jogged and sort of chatted to people and things but you know I've been here with with park run in the Netherlands since the start and and I've loved it I didn't really know much about park run Last week I was talking about being a solo runner and it was the same true there. I mean, I wouldn't really do these events. I, you know, I, the only races I would really do would be a marathon, a couple of marathons a year, and I would very rarely do other distances. But 
the buzz of park run sort of got me interested and so i got involved in it the one that we have here in in harlem is a really nice one it's changed it's they've we've changed the course quite a few times all the organizers have changed the course i'm not going to put myself in the organizer circle i'm just one of the volunteers a frequent volunteer but they've changed the course quite a few times and it's a now a really nice sort of two lap loop around the park and uh for those that don't know the netherlands i mean it really is flat there's a few quite a few tight turns and things but uh, it's still a nice fast course that you can sort of get a decent time on so that's where we're based in Skotobos park so i'll put a link below for those that uh, want to know more about that and i'd love for you to come along but in terms of plugging, how does that connect with plugging? And it connects actually in sort of some really nice, interesting ways. I think the most interesting sort of group one is the fact that they've adopted. So Park Run has adopted the park as as its uh, cleanup area. And what you often see is the marshals in the start before the the Park Run takes place every Saturday. So for those that don't know, it's every Saturday, it's a five kilometer run and it's very inclusive. You can run at whatever speed you, you want. There's a lot of people walking and it's, it has a really nice community feel to it. And that community extends to sort of plogging. I won't say that I've been instrumental in it, but I definitely, I think I've, I've helped a little bit, maybe inspire a few of them to, to do that. So they've adopted the park and they sort of try and clean it up beforehand, which makes it a bit of a problem when I've sort of committed to picking up trash on every run. So if I do the park run, I'll often not find trash for that five kilometers. So what do I do then? Well, what I have to do then is I have to do a little detour. So if you actually look at my park run course, it's slightly different. I do the same distance. I actually do maybe just a few meters more. I just have to sort of like go offline a little bit and then just go onto the roadside so I can get some trash at least for the run. And it has to be one piece, but it has to be some trash on every run I do. So that's one element in terms of how plogging connects with park run here in Harlem is the fact that they've adopted that and and often for the cleanup days when it's on a Saturday then they will sort of get involved in that as well and they'll let me sort of uh, promote me a little bit which is really sort of nice of them but there's a deeper way that I get plogging involved in the park run and that's myself so I live five kilometers away and I'm trying to if you've been following me on this podcast you know that I I'm try to get around 100 kilometers a week in, in terms of running so this is actually perfect for me i never i never treat park run as as a race just more as a a, a place that i can go and volunteer and, and talk to people and have a bit of a fun run so i never go there with a time in mind so i'm quite happy to to run the five kilometers to the event do the five kilometers and then run the five kilometers back so it's a nice sort of 15 kilometer loop for me and of course, then I can really pick up trash on that run there and then on the run back. It goes past a couple of schools and a couple of areas that often have a sort of like hangout places. So I usually get a quite a few bags filled up along that route. So it's, it's really productive for me, it gives me a nice little warm up. And yeah, it really means that I can sort of achieve and make an impact on that day. So plogging is is instrumental in terms of every park run I do, whether it's running or whether it's volunteering. It means I can get a nice five kilometer plug in beforehand and a five kilometer plug afterwards. It's going to that, I don't treat it as a race. I think that's the reason why I prefer to actually volunteer. So if you look at my stats, I wouldn't say I go every week, but I try and go as many weeks as I can. And but I think my volunteer numbers are higher than the my racing i much prefer to volunteer and and sort of stoke the crowd so i'll often do it in my banana suit and and i'll do it with disco music as well I've got a little speaker not sure if that's within sort of the um the sort of theme of park run but it's in my theme so i kind of like doing it and people seem to enjoy it so i sort of just bring my own little music on there and i've got my banana suit just cheering people on and trying to make it as a fun 
day and motivational day as, as I can. And I've got this great big hand. So I've got this, this fantastic hand that I picked up in 2019. So in 2019, there was a running company that a running shoe company that, that sponsored the Kruchtelope here in Harlem, sort of the 10 kilometer run here in Harlem. And, and they were giving away these, these foam hands. And so I grabbed it and kept it. And so even after all these years, I've been using it as my sort of high five hand. I've used it on marathons. I've used it uh, and I use it every time on park run just to give people a high five as they go around. And it really seems to work. There's a couple of kids that are just so fantastic that are going there most weeks now. And you can see they're sort of just jogging. I mean, they're, they are very young. I'm, I, I don't know what their ages are. I'm guessing sort of seven, maybe five, six, seven, something along those lines. And when they see me in the banana suit and they see sort of the hand out, they literally sprint to see who can actually do the high five first. So it's, it's just sort of fantastic. And, and it feels like that way is true as well of, of all the other runners. So I really enjoy doing it. It really brings a sort of smile to my face. There is a confession, though, that I have to do with park run. I'm always late, I, or I'm only ever just on time. And it's sort of a hangover, really, from my 13 years as a, as a, as a part-time, free-time plogger. It really did consume all of my life when I was doing it alongside a full-time job. And... I'll be talking about the movie posters in another time, but I'd, I'd have a, every Saturday I'd have a lot of things to do, but I also had 4,000 kilometers to run. So throwing everything on top of it, Sunday tended to be my very long run day. And Saturday was theoretically my lie in day. So for me to get that five kilometer run in to get there on time, and treating it as my lie-in day, it just never really gelled. And and so there, there are times when if I'm running it, I'll I'll sort of rock up at quarter past nine and then just and then just run. So it doesn't matter about my time. So I don't mind if it if they add fifteen minutes. So my my five k time is usually around forty five minutes or something along those lines, just because I'm there so late. When I'm volunteering, I just get there on time. They. They're very tolerant of me, even though I know I should be there sort of 15 minutes earlier. But the trouble is, going back to that plogging, if I leave the house earlier, thinking, right, I've got plenty of time to get to park run, then all that happens is I pick up more trash and that slows me down. So I get there at the same time. So if I have to actually race there, I usually get there quicker earlier than if I have left myself plenty of time. So if I know I've only, oh, I've only got 25 minutes to get there, then I have to literally sprint and all I can do is pick up a couple of pieces. I know I can't do anything. I've got to make sure I get there on time. Whereas if I've given myself 45 minutes to do a 5K, then what I'll do is I'll sort of slow down. I'll pick up more trash and, and take photos and selfies and really sort of try and do the plugging a lot more. So it never really seems to work out for me. Even if I set the alarm at five in the morning, I will always be there just before uh, nine o'clock and it starts. There's been one time when I was actually a little bit too late. Apologies for that to the race directors, but uh, I do my best. But yeah, it's just something that, that I've struggled with. And even though now it isn't my lie-in day, I think it's just that behavior still sticks and, and I really struggle. So I need to work on that. You heard it here. I will work on it. Do you do park run? I'm so, yeah, for me, it is just such a, a joyous, a joyous event that is so wonderful to take part in. If you haven't done it, definitely check it out and come along and see the banana at Scotoboss Park in Harlem. I think we can now talk about how it went this last week in terms of what happened in the sort of last week in terms of the stats. So I said this last week, it makes sense that I pick up more trash and I run more as a professional than I did as an amateur. So for the last 13 years, I tried, I sort of the last few years, I sort of try and target 
4,000 kilometers of running and, and 40,000 liters of trash. And I really think I could do more than that. So, and that's bearing out now that I haven't got an injury and I'm keeping consistently around that sort of 100 or, or even over 100 kilometers. So last week I got 103 kilometers done, which is a really nice, a nice amount that I'm really happy with. So I think in 2025, I kind of want to get between the 80 and the 100, I think, as an average. And in terms of trash, again, I want to get more than 40,000 litres. So I hit over 1,000 litres last week. So that sort of projects out as 52 litres to 52,000 litres, obviously, if, if I do it every week. But I think sometimes it will be under a thousand sometimes it'd be over but i think i think those are good stats i think i kind of want to get around that five thousand kilometers and fifty thousand liters of trash and and so that seems to be bearing out now so let's see if i can keep it going you'll know first on the podcast i think we're going to keep it there i want to kind of keep these podcasts short and sweet and really just sort of talk about the things that that have gone on so i really want to be under the 30 minutes And that sort of bears out now. But just like I did last week, I do want to give you a tip to close with. And it is related really to how I get to Park Run. Let's do the the end credits and then we can talk about that. Sign off. Picking up just a handful of litter Feels like being sprayed in unicorn glitter It makes the run not just with you It helps the world be clean too People will shout, well done then mate It's something that'll make you feel great So next time you step out of the door Pick up something that needs to do more oh, oh. So my tip for today is perhaps not so much related to plogging, but it's more in terms of my way of life. And it relates to park run. It simply is when I need to get somewhere, I ask myself, can I run there? Can I walk there? Can I run there? If I can, then that's what I would do. And so that's what I do with park run. I can get there by by running. And of course, when I run, I pick up a bit of trash. So not only have I saved money in terms of getting there, I've also keeping myself fit and I'm making an impact. It's kind of cool, huh? And if I can't run there, then I ask myself, can I bike there? If I can't bike there, can I take the bus or, or a train, public transport? Is that another option? And it's only after I can say, I say no to all of those that I'll take the car. It's a simple act, but it really builds up over the years. And it just saves so much money. It's, it's kind of crazy. If you just run everywhere, you're not spending all that money on, on petrol and etc. And parking. It just seems so logical. I don't. Yeah. But that's my tip. My name is Paul. This is my way of life don't need to go as crazy as I am but maybe there are some elements in here that you want to adopt and make it part of your way of life as well thanks for listening my name is Paul speak to you next week bye